So I'm going to jump into it. I have a bit of a quick introduction, then we'll jump into the interview. Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from across Canada. My name is Christopher Brown, and I am your host. Over the course of this show, we will be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, we are honored and so honored to have our guest onto the show today. Please help me welcome to the show Mayor Bonnie Crombie of the city of Mississauga in the province of Ontario. Mayor Crombie, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on today. So, Mayor Crombie, I want to start with this question, and you're no exception to this question, and that is, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? That is a great question. I do feel that politics is a noble profession that, and people you know, sign up because they want to make change and they want to affect change. They want to improve people's lives and improve communities and build great communities and build cities or, or make difference, make a change to our healthcare system, our education system, our immigration system. So usually people feel strongly about something that's so important, near and dear to their heart, whether it's a single issue or just let's improve our community. I know I'm the person that can drive change um, and I'm no different. Um, you know, I, I saw a need to step up federally first uh, and I did so because I, I wanted to be that outspoken voice for my community, which was Streetsville in Mississauga at the time. One of the things that I'd like to get to know about my guest is why politics? Because was politics discussed at the dinner table growing up like it was in my household or was it something that was taboo and not talked about around the table? I'll say with you, it was more taboo and not, but we didn't speak about uh, politics or religion generally. Those were not topics. And uh, I was an only child of, um, I would say my parents were Polish immigrants. They were born in Poland, came through France during the Second World War, and then came to Canada in 1948 after World War II and worked very hard. My grandfather was a laborer and he was the the janitor at the Globe and Mail for 40 years. My grandmother was a seamstress. They had my mother who worked administrative jobs. You had Massey Harris, Massey Ferguson, met my father who was also Polish, my biological father. And he was very popular, had a lot of charisma, very smart guy. And uh, that lasted about three years. <laughs> they divorced <laughs> and uh, I was product of that. And then she, um, so my adopted father, who she remarried, was active uh, at the municipal level. He had friends that ran for city council and he would canvass for them. But largely politics wasn't discussed. Uh, I would say that my parents' politics um, and my own were different, uh, were different. I I saw an inclusive neighborhood growing up in the High Park Ronsonsville's area. People were, you know, at the time, multicultural meant you came from Poland or Ukraine or Russia or, you know, it wasn't from Caribbean islands or from India or Pakistan where many people come today. Uh, but yet, at a young age, a friend of mine in school, we had moved to Etobicoke, a suburb of Toronto, Western End, and his uncle uh, was a cabinet minister in the Pierre Trudeau government. And he said at school one day, we were 16, 17-ish, finishing off high school, I have to help my uncle this weekend. And, you know, we're going to, we're going to deliver brochures. Are you free? Can you help me? Will you join me? And I said, I, I have, you know, nothing too much to do, plan this weekend, homework, et cetera. Sure, I'd be happy to join you. And it spoke to me because his uncle was Stanley Haidash who was the minister of multiculturalism in the Trudeau, Trudeau, wow. Pierre Trudeau, right? And here the minister is Polish and we're Polish immigrants. And this really resonated with me that even Polish immigrants could go far in government and make a difference and make a change. And so I, from that young age, joined the Ontario Liberal Party and the Federal Liberal Party and went through, you know, um, all the youth caucuses and the policy conventions and the AGMs and got really engaged and then started assisting on whoever ran locally, helping their campaigns, you know, delivering brochures, giving my input, whatever it was worth. And once in a while, somebody important would come and I try to give them my ideas on what changes need to be made. Uh, and then, you know, worked on leadership campaigns as well. And fast forward, I had a, a business career. And if you want to ask me about that, happy to well share and work. I, I would love to chat with you about that, but I want to focus on the municipal aspect of your journey because okay. 
municipal is where I, 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 I thrive because I think it's the front line of government and it's the government that often gets overlooked at the, uh, on the national stage. And in 2011, you made the decision to jump into a by-election in Ward 5 of Mississauga. Now, I, I, I'm not I'm not breaking any uh, secrets here, but you had oh. just come off a defeat of a uh, federal election and you decided to run municipally. What was the decision to get back into the political arena, but do it on the municipal level? Yeah, you know, that was a really tough decision because uh, all Liberal MPs, all, all but seven or eight, had lost. We lost the election soundly. We were now the third or fourth party in, in the legislature federally, and we're nowhere on the scene. And Mayor Hazel McCallion was a dear friend of mine and supported my federal career and used to come to some of my campaign events and fundraisers. She came to my election night party, which we had thought would be a victory party, but wasn't. And I often joke, I would, I took the early retirement package. Uh, and she said, well, there's a spot on my council. You know, you have been a great MP. You could be a great counselor. Why don't you come and join my council? And initially I thought, mm, I, you know, I like the federal issues, the immigration file, the, uh, the health file, the finance file. I always talk about the budget. But then at the end of the day, you know, you have to dust yourself off and prop yourself back up after defeat isn't easy. It's pretty tough. And you, you learn, you, you learn from defeat. And uh, what was the biggest eye opening experience though? What was like campaigning federally and campaigning municipally are two different unique beasts in itself. Well, interestingly, there is a story there. I would go to doors and they would say, <laughs> really like you, Bonnie. You work hard. I don't like your leader. I don't like your party. But if it was just you, I would vote for you. Yep. You made a difference in our community and you're a hard worker. So I thought about that. In fact, when Hazel made her offer that there was going to be a by-election because one of her counselors ran federally and was elected. And it took me a little while because at first, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. It's tough to be defeated. And I loved my work. I loved, uh, you know, public service and uh, I love the work I was doing. I was on many committees and it doesn't matter. I thought about it and I thought, she's right. I can continue to serve the community and this is closer to the people. So where the rubber hits the road and I could impact people's lives immediately, not make grand speeches in the House of Commons and hope someday somebody takes my suggestions and acts on them. This is immediate. I could be on council and I could make difference right away for people immediately. I thought, She's right. I'm going to do this. I registered. There were 26 candidates already in the race, <laughs> including a former member of parliament, also somebody I knew in the community, Carolyn Parrish, yep. the, the husband of the councillor who had resigned to run federally, and the woman who came second to her in the last race, those were the top, the top field, plus another, the MC of many local community events who had a very high profile. I mean, this was not a given I was going to win. But I worked very, very hard. And, you know, it came nine o'clock at night and we'd be knocking on doors and pe my, my team would say, Bonnie, people are in their pajamas. I really feel like we're disturbing people. I said, we just have to finish the street. We're just going to finish the street. We're not going to get back here. And so we work very hard. And, you know, with a lot of vote splitting that occurs, I ended up successful. I think I positioned myself as being on Hazel's team and one of the other strong candidates led the kind of opposing Hazel team, let's say. And so I think people can push came to show. We have two former MPs here. One is on Hable's team, one not so much. And, you know, they sided with me. It got me onto council and did a lot of great work here and really did make a difference in people's lives. It started at one of my first initiatives was to host more town hall meetings. Every month I would have a town hall meeting uh, in my community to talk about issues and invite people to ask questions. I held office hours in the most northern part of my ward, which is north of the airport, which is a great distance, a 30 mile, 30 minute drive from City Hall. So I thought Queens City Hall should go to the community rather than the community come to City Hall. So I went up there um, and then I created a shinny hockey league for what I 
felt where, you know, some underprivileged South Asian kids that people thought, oh, they're not going to play hockey. It's not their culture. I said, they're Canadian. It's, it, there's ice and snow. Of course they want to play hockey. So we created a kind of a low cost league that they could test the water before trying, before entering in, you know, the organized hockey leagues for them. And then I created a business improvement area. So we did a lot of great work locally. And I thought, I like this. This makes it, this is making a difference in people's lives uh, and in the community. And people really appreciate work I'm doing. And then one day, Hazel called me. I got a phone call. Hazel wants to see you. And you know, sometimes uh -oh. the boss, uh oh, the boss wants to see you, right? And there's a long walk down two corridors between my office and hers to her office and mine. And that walk was, oh no, what did I do wrong? What is she going to, you know, admonish me about this time? <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> I was a little concerned. So I got there and of course she was busy signing documents and looked up at me and said, hmm, you know, I hear you're going back to Ottawa. I'm going to be a federal member. And I said, no, no, no. I love my work here. No decisions have been made. And she said, good, because I'm going to retire. And uh, she's 92, by the way, at this point, because <laughs> I'm going to retire. And I think you should put your name in for mayor. And I'm like, Hazel McCallion just say I could do her job. Right, you know? Then I looked at her and I said, Hazel, you're 92 years old. God bless you. You've had an incredible career. Yeah, I agree. You could use, uh, you could use go gardening and do whatever it is you want to do. You could support women's hockey. Uh, but that's a big leap. I haven't made any, I haven't even considered it. <laughs> Let me give that some thought. So I went home and talked to my team. And of course, they were already signing up people to help and said, yep, you're going to run for mayor. <laughs> so and then I had a very formidable opponent. The first go around, it was um, one of my counselor's fathers who had been uh, a counselor briefly, then an MPP, and then a cabinet minister in Ottawa, and then was CEO of the WSIB, Steve Mahoney. He was incredible. And he was a friend of mine. It was so hard to run against a friend. Uh, and he was formidable. But I want I to talk about the the, the the responsibility of, of a municipal counselor and a municipal mayor. How much weight and responsibility do you put on yourself every time you walk into that council chambers to make sure you're educated in all the matters that are going to be presented to you, but not so cemented in the way you're about to vote? Because you may hear a different opinion from one of your fellow councillors. And that's the great thing about municipal government, I find, is you can make up your mind the moment you vote. You're not whipped. You're not uh, structured into a party. You are of one person, one vote. How much of a weight do you put on yourself every time you walk into that council chambers? And does it change from the weight you put on yourself as a councillor to the weight you put on yourself as a mayor? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, it doesn't change. I take my job very, uh, I'm very responsible. I take the job very seriously. And there is a majesty in walking into that council chamber, for sure. And we have, a, I, my predecessor, Hazel McCallion, was known to say, do your homework, make sure you do your homework. And there isn't a council meeting that goes by that someone doesn't quote her. <laughs> <laughs> and so you can bet, we are one of the most prepared councils anywhere. Uh, and, you know, my schedule is very busy. There are a lot of community events that I attend, too many, in fact, as a mm -hmm. dozen on a weekend and two or three every evening and I always said to my staff please carve out reading time I have to be sure I have my binders read because you know I can't be reading them at 9 10 11 at night because you're tired and you have to focus so there's a significant amount of reading to do I mean there are weekends I bring nine binders home because we have a planning meeting an audit committee meeting we have a, a general committee meeting we have a, a region appeal because we have two-tier government here or we did and now it's being dissolved to, you know a police board meeting a lecture meeting uh, whatever else you can think of we had meetings uh priorities and policy committee meetings you know and it's a sunday afternoon going on sunday evening and there are a lot of reading to do for to, for the morning for the day tomorrow but i know we all take it very seriously i've never seen any of my counselors not prepared not having gone through their binders you know i could see note tabs and notes and now many of them are using their computers and they've got highlights there too so we always have very robust discussion and you're quite right you know you go in formulating an opinion and Sometimes some of them will have already written a motion 
uh, to support their opinion. No, that's okay. That's good. And then that's good because I put it on the floor and we discuss and debate the motion at hand, right? Rather than the staff report. Um, and other times, you know, people come in with set views as you describe and their views evolve over the conversation. Um, but more often than not, as you would expect, people come in with preconceived notions. I will share with you the recent uh, cannabis debate, if you will. So we were one of the larger communities in Ontario that, that did not opt into cannabis sale. We didn't. We wanted control over uh, zoning and concentration of source. We didn't want them all in, you know, radius of two blocks. We wanted them spread out across the city. We wanted control over where they would be, not in sensitive use, not near daycares or drop-in centers or community centers, schools, etc. cetera. Um, and the first time we had that vote, it was two to 10. Two in favor, 10 opposed. Then things evolved as people were doing their homework and their due diligence and observing other practices in other municipalities. The vote was four to eight. And they asked me to have another vote. And I said, not until I have a new council, because I know I don't think this vote will budge from four to eight, uh, four, four and eight opposing. And I have a new council. And we asked for the report to come forward again, updated, you know, on what's been the impact on uh, cannabis sales in other municipalities. Um, and, and one counselor in particular did a lot of homework. He went and toured cannabis shops in other municipalities, talked to owners of those shops, did research on the impacts. Um, and he was kind of a on the fence vote. We weren't sure which way he was going to go. But again, I knew the four people for sure who were going to vote against it. But now there seemed to be with the new counselors or more openness. They were younger. They were more diverse than the counselors had left my council were older and more homogeneous. And there was an openness to it. And when one of my diverse counselors, Deepika De Merla, she said, all I see is a plethora of illegal stores. We're not shutting out cannabis sales. We're shutting out legal cannabis in favor of illegal cannabis it coupled with illegal activity around that store and the proceeds are going to the fund illegal uh, illegal activity so we're not further ahead here we're further behind you know we should allow legal stores so at least it's a controlled substance people know what they're getting and it's safer that and i think that argument really resonated so when we took the vote i knew four of them for sure was not going to have anything to do with it there were four of the previous eight and there were four new ones and the vote was the reverse, eight in favor, four opposed. So it won soundly, uh, but is people it, did, the, did the research. Is it easy to admit that you have to wait sometimes to get the vote you want? Because yes. in, in municipal government, your decisions happen the day after you make that decision at council. Federal, provincially, it can take like three to six months to even see some movement. But municipally, the day after things happen, for, yeah, for so municipal cautious. Yeah, yeah okay. and in here we uh, we're risk a little bit risk averse because of our community is very uh I would say socially conservative community here. We have a very diverse community. I'd say almost 60% were born abroad. Um and so we're very you know, very aware of their views. Um and e even with the Uber debate, it took me 2 years to get a pilot project a pilot project to test it, to test it. Before that, those Uber drivers are bandits. Let's respect the taxi industry. And I said, how about we deregulate the taxi industry? They've got way too many regulations on them. Let's lift some of those because we're responsible for that. Um, you know, and then maybe put a few more on the Uber drivers or at least create a level playing field. And then we won't have so much, so many issues with them coming in because you can't stop, you know, innovation or, you know, um, the uber it wasn't going to be it, we were it wasn't we weren't able to find them etc so it, that took two years to convince them to try uh and that was after trying to enforce ticketing and you know it just didn't work because of course it's innovation and it's technology and you can't stop technology I, I want to turn to this my second last question because i know you are uh tight on time so i want to make sure i get this win <laughs> municipal municipal governments are the front line of governments. I've said that. 
your residents of Mississauga, and I say this to every municipal councilor or mayor who comes on the show, will come to you as a municipal leader and talk to you about federal issues and provincial issues. That's and right. let's let, let exactly they don't know. They truly don't. Un and I'm not saying they don't know. It's they don't care in some sense, because really, you're an elected official and they want you to solve their issue. Oh, as, a, them. as a mayor of a city that's relatively one of the largest cities in all of Ontario and one of the largest cities in Canada. Third, third how, how, Canada. How, do, how do you balance the federal, provincial, municipal issues? Because you can't just tell someone that's not my issue. That's a provincial issue. Go talk to your MPP or go talk to your MP because let's be honest, most residents will go, well, I've elected you to represent my issues and these are my right. issues. <laughs> yeah, it's very tough sometimes if they want a letter of reference or they're looking for a visa for a family member and they come to me for a letter of support and I'll say, well, you remember at one point I was a federal member and you came to me for those letters because that was my responsibility. But now as mayor, it's not our responsibility. And they, and they But they don't see it that way. They see you in a position of authority, elected person that can help them. So you write the letter because we want one because we elected you and because, you, you know, you're a prominent figure and that'll hold weight in the view of, you know, the immigration officer. And I said, well, they won't really, it won't count, but if it's important to you, I'll write it. But it's much more important that you go speak your federal member. So we get many calls and emails to the office and we spend time explaining, you know, what their issue involves and how they need to connect with, well, particularly some of the provincial decisions that impact the city, um, the ones in, that, that hmm, you know, change our planning and zoning rules, et cetera. And we encourage them to go reach out to their provincial member of parliament to if they have a complaint you know we'll explain that well we don't agree with either but this is now provincial legislation or provincial legislation requires us to do it this way here's you you know where do you live this is your provincial member please reach out to them so you know if it's not our it wasn't our responsibility to create that legislation we are going to steer them in the direction where they can express their joy or frustration <laughs> I want to turn to my last question, and this is a question that's relatively new to uh, Mississauga, but I'm assuming there's been a lot of work behind the scenes. But the Hazel McCallion Act, yes, you've already mentioned a little bit about the Peel region being dissolved and Mississauga becoming its own uh, single-tier municipality. For you, what does this mean for the people of Mississauga going forward? Because while you were still a region, it's coming in 2025, January 1st. You will be a single tier municipality once again, not since 1974, I believe. That's right. Yes, the region was created by Bill Davis, the premier at the time, who wanted uh, Mississauga, it was acknowledged, was going into our growth phase. We were going to be the first of these three municipalities uh, that would uh, develop and grow. And we were set up to fund the growth and development of the other two. So for us, it's liberation, it's independence. It also means that we can now invest our tax dollars into our city. Um, our, you know, now we can actually have funding for our own priorities rather than fund a different level of government. We provided for 40 years, 70% of the costs of the region appeal in the past 10 years. That's dropped down to 60% because of Brampton's growth. But for the first 40 years, when all the infrastructure was being built, the waste plant, the wastewater plant, the water treatment plant, et cetera, we provided 70% of the funding because it was our growth. So in addition, we provide a transfer payment to Brampton uh, of 84 million a year for their regional roads, their planning and their policing. So we are actually paying for the policing bulk of it in Brampton and there are higher policing needs in Brampton and Mississauga pays for them. Um, and so for us, it just means that we can eliminate the transfer payment and over a decade, the next decade, we'll be a billion dollars ahead because we won't have to fund a second level of government so we can eliminate all that cost, all that duplication and cut all that red tape because don't forget, having two tiers of government means when your development applications are approved here, they have to go up to transportation and works uh, and, the, and the legal department up at the region to be vetted and commented on as well. So here we, you know, have them commented on, vetted on here. And then they have to go up there and I have to get buy-in from the other two municipalities that it's a priority for resources on um, 
on the uh, servicing on the pipes and and white water, wastewater, et cetera. And and uh, and they may or may not agree. So, you know, this allows us to control our own destiny and make our own decisions at one council table, which is only fair for the third largest city in Ontario, second largest economy, and the sixth or seventh largest city in Canada. It just wasn't right. And and our partner in this um, alliance, the region of Peel, the city of Brampton is the fourth largest city in Ontario, the ninth largest city in Canada. And so to suggest for a moment that they can't stand on their own two feet is wrong. And you have smaller cities like in, in Ontario, people places where people will know Barrie and Belleville and Kingston, London, Ontario, Windsor, uh, you know, these are prominent cities that are all single tier. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, they don't struggle. So it's time for Brampton to cut the to cut the umbilical cord and time for them to stand on their own two feet. So this will be a big change for us. So we'll have one level of government. We'll be able to make all the decisions um, at, at one uh, in at one council table rather than do the duplication of doing it twice at two. One last question. I know this this is this is an important question I should have asked beforehand, but what makes Mississauga such a unique place to live, work, and raise a family? Well, we're very proud because uh, of our name. It's a uh, we it's a Ojibwe heritage. It means river of the north of many mouths. So we're proudly named after the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. We take that very seriously. But we're also home to Canada's largest airport. The airport technically is in Mississauga. So we, we get a little tax uh, per, per passenger. And we're pretty happy about that as well. A big source of revenue for us. But we're also home to 100,000 businesses, 75 Fortune 500 companies, 1,400 multinationals. As I said, there are people here from 150 different countries. They speak 200 different languages. Um, and they come highly trained and highly skilled. I will say that 20% of our residents have a post-secondary degree and uh, a certification so that they're engineers or accountants or you know lawyers or whatever it might be they have a special certification so we have a highly trained highly skilled workforce that's energized and the talent pool is is very important we are able to attract a lot of investment here because of the diversity of the languages and the highly trained uh, uh pool of of work of workforce Plus, it helps having the airport. So we have the largest aerospace in sector in Canada with the largest number of employees. Um, and, and advanced manufacturing is one of our key pillars, as is life sciences. Many refer to Mississauga as Pill Hill, where a lot of <laughs> biotech, biopharma is. Obviously, ICT, we're firmly on the innovation corridor as well. We have a hub called Idea Mississauga that's a resource. It's part accelerator, part incubator, and entrepreneurs can go there for resources. We're very proud of that. It helps nurture that innovation, innovative in ecosystem here in Mississauga. Uh, and then finance. We're the uh, second largest with Toronto uh, financial centers in North America, New York, and the GTA, including Mississauga. Uh, so we're very proud of that. Uh, having strength in finance, finance, we call it fire, finance, insurance, and real estate. Very wow. strong there as well. So Ma it's a, it's a incredible place to live, to work and raise your family. And many, you know, almost 800,000 people just shy, choose it as their home, as I did as the place to raise my children, uh, largely based on Hazel McCallion's vision of the day as a wonderful, safe uh, a community that uh, the quality of life, as Hazel would say, is second to none. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Crombie, I want to thank you so much for sitting down today and chatting with me. Um, I'm looking forward to visiting Mississauga when I come back to Ontario later this summer to visit my family. And I'm looking forward to seeing the vibrant community that you've just explained to me. So thank you so much for sitting down and doing this today. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we're warm, welcoming, vibrant, inclusive. I should have mentioned that too. We celebrate all each other. Uh, every festival we celebrate. We all know the words uh, Eid Mubarak. Uh, Diwali, we know all those words. <laughs> Merry yeah. Christmas, too. <laughs> and, well, with that, and, I want to thank everyone for tuning in <laughs> for thank another you. great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Till tomorrow, talk to you later. Mm -hmm.